Hi, I'm Janine Marie and you are watching Pure Elite TV and I am here with Pure Elite CEO Stuart Armstrong. Welcome to Pure Elite TV. I think this is your first time featuring. Um, yeah, it probably is, I think. Yeah. I've threatened to uh, do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word threatened. <laughs> yeah, I've threatened a few times to do the uh, Pure Elite News, but I haven't. That would be interesting. I actually think you should do that. We're going to hold him to that Pure Elite News from Stuart Armstrong coming soon. You'll regret that. <laughs> um, today's interview is going to be um, discussing the history of Pure Elite, what brought it into fruition, all in celebration of Pure Elite's birthday on the 7th of April. Um, so are you ready for your first question? Yeah, firstly, I can't believe that Pure Elite's been going for six years. Did I, I got that right, didn't I? I know that you mentioned how long, but that's fine. <laughs> it's because the 6th and the 7th of the day, it's all too close. Yeah, can you, seven, six years. Mm. Because in my head, I still think it's like two or three years old. Yeah, no, six years in an industry which I would say is probably 10 years old. Yeah, so OG at this point. Yeah, it's, it's weird because sometimes I think about us still being like one of the new kids on the block when we're clearly not. <laughs> no, definitely not anymore. I think we've uh, earned our stripes as it's as it said. Um, okay, so where did the concept of Pure Elite come from? Okay, so a um, little bit of a long story, but um, so in 2012, um, I was diagnosed with a lung condition and I was put onto medication and the medication makes you gain weight. So then from that, I decided to prove that I could lose the weight from the medication um, and that no medication really can dictate what size you are and that type of thing. So I did a, um, like a 12 week transformation that got picked up by um, a local newspaper and the British Lung Foundation and a website and I had a few little photo shoots for them, pictures sent through. Um, and then I was deciding what to do basically and I was training the gym. Um, a guy in the gym told me that he was competing in a show and that no one was really coming to watch him and I should go and watch. And you and I went and watched. We sat and watched it, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it, but there were just things on the day that I would do differently. Um, one of the things that stands out to me was, I remember when there were call outs. There were six people on stage and five people got called forward and one got left at the back of the stage. Yeah. It just annoyed me. Like it really didn't. There was no need. There's no need to do that, and especially for myself coming into the industry and, and looking at it from like a like a new, fresh pair of eyes. I'm like, I didn't quite understand the concept of leaving someone at the back of the stage. Um, so, which is one reason why purely doesn't have call outs. Um, every single person gets called forward, and um, we move people around on the stage. So, if, for instance, we want our top five and to work out who's going to place where, we just move people around and stand them next to each other. And if I have to keep people on stage. For 45 minutes or an hour I'll keep them on stage for however long I want to keep mm. them on stage until I'm happy and the rest of the judges are happy um, so, so there, was, there was that and just a few other things throughout the day that just wasn't happy about you and I spoke yeah had the conversation there and then and it was just the case of well instead of complaining do something about it um, and from that day by the time we had watched it spoken about it and then drove home um, purely it was created just not the name yeah in fact on that subject before we move on to the next question uh, would you like to mention anything about <laughs> picking not the, the name. name yeah um, I had a name um, and it was a really good name and I couldn't get a domain for it someone had a company it was nothing to do with fitness competing um, which was different and I, oh, I spent days and days just literally all day thinking of names searching um, and I eventually came up with uh, Pure Elite um, by process of elimination, to be <laughs> do quite honest. Do you remember that? I do. Actual yeah. process I of do. elimination. Finding words that I liked and then they were taken and sitting with a thesaurus, basically, <laughs> going, what about this, what about that, what about this? Um, uh, yeah, and came with Pure Elite. The thing is, I can't imagine it being called anything else now. Really no. Good. 
It is, I, I think it's quite funny because when people often ask about where did the name come mm. from, that it's funny that it was an actual process of elimination. As Stuart mentioned, he basically got a list of words that he liked, yeah. that he felt kind of um, embodied what a fitness model show is. And then I sat there on the laptop checking <laughs> to see if it was available until, mm. you, I think there was a few different options and settled on Pure Elite, if yeah. I remember rightly. Yeah, yeah it was, yeah. Um, but just to add to that, that was a, a that was a lengthy process. It wasn't mm. just a case of pin drop name. Woo-hoo. No, the, the the name did take for ages, and one, in fact, it, in hindsight, it took too long. Um, from a, from a business point of view, um, I think a lot of people think too much about the name of something, um, when in reality. None of us knew what Google was. <laughs> like we wouldn't have used it to put a website, or whatever. Um, so the name is sort of really irrelevant. Um, and yeah, I, I can't imagine it being called anything apart from Pure now, which is strange. What's in a name? As I think Shakespeare said, I could be making it up. Some some famous dead person said it. Um, you just said it. <laughs> I'm not dead. Not famous. Okay. Um, what did you do before this? Before the purely and fitness industry. Um, so I used to head up um, seven departments for a company called LexisNexis. That's not the car company. Um, <laughs> LexisNexis are the largest publishers of legal, um, financial and um, compliance data in the world. So when you see a lawyer going into court and they've got all of their books being carried in for them, um, we sell those books. So we keep lawyers up to date so they know what... We, I none of a work there, still feel like I do. Um, I used to keep them up to date. Um, and then the same for tax, that would be for accountants, making sure they've got all of the relative tax information. Um, and then compliance is like health and safety and those type of things. So I used to manage the sales and, sales and marketing departments, focusing on telesales. Um, and within the direct marketing, email marketing, and what was then internet marketing, because social media wasn't really a thing. Um, yeah, that was an admin and PAs and all the processes that type of thing. So have you always worked in that industry, like that yeah. type of, my, within that job position? Um, yeah, my, my first job was um, trainee accountancy at Pfizer um, and I was going to go the whole accountancy route. Um, so I did all my qualifications for that. And then I remember one day I, so I, I used to do um, tax and treasury and I, and I did expenses one day. And I remember looking at the sales team's expenses. And I was like, this, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't for me. Because as, as a child, if you'd asked me when I was 14, I would have said I was going to be a stockbroker. Um, that was the career path in front of me, a stockbroker or completely left field, um, a computer programmer. That were the two things that interested me. I like maths and I like numbers and I like money. So stockbroker or writing uh, computer programs or computer games or whatever. Um, but after that, yeah, I've always worked in, in sales, sales and marketing. So I worked in um, telecoms just after deregulation of the market, which was a great time to be in telecoms. <laughs> um, I worked in, um, I set up an Argentinian-based company, moved over here, which was doing office stationery and toiletries and stuff. Then I um, sold data, so a bit like Experian. Yeah. Um, so people would come and buy data for um, direct marketing campaigns or email marketing campaigns, um, and we would either just sell data or I would design the campaign for them. But, yeah, I've done a lot of jobs then. Um, <laughs> I did consultancy, um, working for myself for about 18 months to two years. Um, what did you specialise in? Mainly still staying in um, telecoms. Mm. Um, and um, so telecoms, setting up lines, premium rate numbers, um, and then just consultancy in business, helping businesses grow, helping them do their marketing campaigns. Then um, insurance. Then from insurance went to LexisNexis. So basically, I was working with AI. Like, it wasn't AIG, but it was sort of linked to AIG um, before the crash. Um, mm. When and obviously AIG went bankrupt, I think in the end. Um, but yeah, I did that for about a year. Headed up about four departments for them. So what was it like to go from kind of? corporate world, managing uh, a number of different departments, a number of different people to then go in into uh, fitness events 
based industry although it's in the fitness industry specifically it's quite niche the fitness uh, competitive industry what was that transition like um on one hand it's, it's completely different because the corporate world it's you're working within a um you're in a world where you're all playing the same game and you sort of understand the rules um, and I, I'm highly competitive. So if I've got a company that is um, my competitor, I like that tussle. Um, I like that sort of, they're now the market leader, now we're like the market leader. Um, and if someone does a good marketing campaign and it's a better campaign than me, fair play. Like I, I like that type of thing. I think that's different. I think because um, you've got a lot of small companies um, people sort of take it personally. It's like, <laughs> I could do a marketing campaign and they might take offence from it or someone else might do a marketing campaign and someone else does. And it, and it seems a little bit, people seem a little bit more bitchy and a little bit more um, personal. But I get it. You're a smaller company. It's taking money, it's taking direct money away from you and food off of your own table. Um, I suppose it's more of a direct link, isn't it? Especially within... I wouldn't say smaller companies, but when the head person that has more of a direct yeah. influence and direct contact with customers, I guess. Yeah, so, that, so that's something that, that I've noticed. The way, the way people react, like if I think of a, a, a good campaign to do, um, and it might be a little bit cheeky or whatever, um, not everyone sees it as being, being that, which is quite funny. Um, also, obviously stuck from a staff point of view. So in the last job, um, over five years, I probably hired, I don't know, three, four, five thousand people. Um, probably fired three, four, five thousand people. Um, but I had like so you've got large teams, um, and obviously big budgets, mm. um, and you're you're spending someone else's money, which is always a nicer thing to do than spending your own. Yeah, but you're also making <laughs> someone else's money. True. Um, so I think I worked out the other day. I probably made other people. In excess of 50 million, wow. I would say. And that was just in a 10-year period. That is an excessive amount of money. Mm. Yeah, but I got paid for it. That's my job. So one, one of the other differences as well, though, is the, the freedom. So I love working. Like, I absolutely love it. Um, and when I was in what, what people obviously call the corporate world, my life was just working. That's all I did. My hobbies working. My weekends were working. If I wasn't physically in the building working, I was thinking about working. Um, my whole life really was geared around strategy and um, sort of uh, just my, my brain was full up of strategy, thinking about what I'm going to do. I could be finishing work on a Friday, I wake up on a Saturday and I'm already thinking about the Monday. Um, weekends sometimes were a hindrance to me. Would you say it was a sort of borderline obsession maybe? Um, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say obsession because I, it was just something I enjoyed. It's, it's, it was something I got enjoyment from, and I would do it for, for free. Like so, a passion then. Yeah, passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I just enjoy it. I, I really do enjoy it. Um, but with this and, and pure elite, the difference being is you can sometimes be a little bit more relaxed because you get more freedom, um, and it allows you to have. Um, more of a personal life and more um, relaxing and you can you, you tend to enjoy it in a different way so obviously I get to engage with customers far more mm -hmm. and obviously in large companies I would rarely engage with the customers unless there was a problem yeah um, or if it was a big customer the big customers were given to me and the more my career went the more I got away from the customer. So mm. when I was 20, when I first got promoted and became a manager, I would have um, a number of accounts that I would deal with um, and I'd still be selling and practically selling on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then say by the time I'm 25, because I'm managing departments, it's less customers that I'm speaking to. And then by the time I got to 30, I would speak to a customer five or six a year and it's a complaint. Yeah, and um, that's all you're dealing with is, is literally a complaint. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now I can I can speak to customers on day to day. So that's, and you don't even think of them as customers. I don't think of someone that enters purely necessarily straight away as a customer, and, and until I look at accounts and figures and facts and figures, and then you look at the numbers as customers, yeah. not the person's name as a customer. If that makes sense. Yeah, I I, um, I understand that, and I also personally agree as well is whenever they're referred to as customers it throws me off a little bit yeah 
Um, next question, which you've already answered, which was going to be how does the fitness industry compare to the previous, to your previous? Everyone's industries. fitter and healthier. Everyone <laughs> is fitter and healthier. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and likes to take selfies. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people have mentioned that Pure Elite came into the industry and changed and innovated in many ways. What is your opinion on that? How does that make you feel? Um, it does make me happy. And um, it, I sort of get a smile on my face when I see um, shows that were either around before Pure Elite or after Pure Elite that start doing categories that I implemented. Um, I remember in 2013 speaking to a competitor before the first Pure Elite and they were saying about they'd competed at three different shows and there was no water backstage. And, and for instance, I was just like, well, that just seemed weird. So at every single show from the very first one, we've always bought enough water for everyone backstage. Um, and I now know other shows replicate that. Um, we have treats backstage. I know other shows now replicate that. Um, every single competitor, we've always given them a medal from the very first show. Nearly every show I see now does that, yeah. which to me is, a, is, a, is amazing. So that, those, those little things, it's, I don't get um, petty or ownership over that. And I know some people are, oh, this person's copying me. You don't really own an idea. I don't, I don't necessarily yeah. believe in owning an idea. If, if people believe in owning an idea, Apple never would have sold a mobile phone because they didn't invent the mobile phone. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I take pride in it, to be honest. Um, so I guess the positives of that with regards to other people kind of following suit is it that at the end of the day that the athletes actually gain more from it if yeah. other shows are copying the same categories that are good ideas if other shows are putting water and treats backstage the athletes benefit and yeah. if they're you know if everyone's getting a medal at every show again the athletes benefit yeah. so I, how does it feel not only have you changed the way that uh, the industry is sort of ran, so to speak, but how does it feel to know that you've had an impact on how athletes are, in essence, treated across the board, so to speak? Yeah, well, that, well for anyone that knows me, um, one of the things that I hate is sort of injustice. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it gets my back up sometimes um, too much, to be honest. <laughs> um, so, I so I like that. I, I do like that. Um, like I said, there's probably ideas I've seen from other shows. Well, the idea of Pure Elite came from us watching another show. Yeah. Um, so we literally watched another show and thought we can improve on this. So yeah, I, I've got no problem with someone looking at Pure Elite going, I like that idea, I like that idea, and I think I can do it better. It's my job to go, oh, okay, you think you can do it better? I can now do it better than you. Yeah. Um, and that continuously improves the market for um, customers, mm -hmm. which is why, <laughs> I won't go down this tangent, but. Obviously, which is why I'm against some shows telling people where they can and can't compete because that reduces um, competition between the shows. So yeah. if you don't feel you've got any competition, you don't necessarily improve. Mm -hmm. And if you're not improving, you're not putting your customer at the center of your business, yeah. um, which I disagree with. Um, but I won't go on down that one um, because that's the me and the injustices <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's good to see that um, the industry is booming and that the shows, in my opinion, are, are run better. Um, and that people are in a position where they feel comfortable to look at other shows and go, oh, do you know what, I quite like that idea because like I said, purely came from us going and watching our show. Yeah. But what I guess uh, one of the impacts that you have, I would say, is raise the industry standard. Yeah. Um, right, so my next question is, what makes purely unique different to other shows? And what is it about you that I'm you would say I'm is... I'm unique and different. <laughs> Aren't we all? But what is it about you particularly that has the impact? I mean, I suppose we just touched on it a little bit, but is it, do you think there's anything more? Yeah, no, I do. The, the, the comp I find it interesting that um, you can have the same competitors do purely and different shows, mm -hmm. and they report back that the atmosphere at Purely has been better. Um, to me, that is interesting because I'm like, well, you are the same people, yeah. just in a different environment. Um, so yeah, I. What was the main question again? Because I'm going. Uh, what makes Purely unique, different? Yeah. So to me, it's 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 the athletes and competitors coming in and the way that they 
um, behave, their, their environment, the way they take on the pure elite sort of ethos, which is having a good time, enjoying yourself, everybody's treated equally. Um, and, and, and maybe that's it. Maybe the fact that I think it's pretty clear that everyone's treated equally. I don't care why you buy your bikini from, I don't care who tans you, um, no judge can um, judge a category where they've been paid. So basically if you're a PT, you can't judge, you can't judge that category. Um, I've got no problem with, I've sacked 5,000 people, I've got no problem telling someone that you Me included twice. She Just deserved it. it out there. Um, <laughs> like I've got no problem turning someone that they weren't good enough for the criteria. Um, all, the, all those little things which gives trust um, to the competitors. So I think when they're backstage, because they know that, you don't get that sort of animosity. Not easy for me to say my M's. Animosity. <laughs> An- animosity. <laughs> it's right here underneath. Um, and, and I think potentially that allows the atmosphere to be more friendly um, and that sort of more of a family sort of vibe. Yeah. Um, which I get. I don't get to see it because I'm out front. It's just what people <laughs> constantly say to me. Um, but in the in the groups and in the in the in the Facebook groups and things, it's it's one of the things that I notice is the way that people get on because it is a competition. Yeah. And people are competing against each mm-hmm. other, but they know they're going to be treated fairly based on their criteria, and um, that means that all they've got to do is just give their best. Yeah. So, what would you say the pure elite values are then? Uh, Specifically, so the first, when we first started was treating everyone fairly. Yeah, that that was the that was the first thing. So when we went and watched um, another show and left, it was one of the things that I like I said with the person being left at the back of the stage. Um, it was a lady back of the stage. Um, so that people being treated fairly um, and never sort of allowing people to believe or think um, that they're not all treated equally. So that that was the main thing. But as it as it's, as it's grown. Um, it's obviously now incorporated things like um, trying to promote our athletes as much as possible on social media, um, making sure that everything is completely transparent so people know exactly what the criteria is, what we're judging to, um, a nice friendly family environment that we're welcoming for first timers. Each year, the number of first timers we get grows. So I think this show is uh, 63, 64%, something mm-hmm. like that, are, are first time competitors. Um, but if I had to just pick one, it would be the one which started purely, which was everybody's treated the same fairly and equally. So what would you say if you could pick one favourite aspect of Pure Elite that gives you the most joy or the most interest or the most drive, what would that particular aspect be? Seeing um, the athletes grow and develop. Mm -hmm. So coming from my previous jobs, one of the things I got the most pleasure out was training people and seeing people develop. Um, I always remember a question I was asked and it was probably over 10 years ago um, and it was how can I get a sales team to um, sell like me Mm -hmm. Um, so they wanted basically how could I replicate myself Um, because okay okay, I'm I'm waffling here but it's one of the problems within sales you have someone that's good at selling and you point me to a manager's position but I might not be good at managing yeah Um, whereas I believe I'm good at managing and I guess most of the companies that hired me thought the same. Um, so it was, so that type of mindset is something I've always enjoyed. Like, yeah. how, how do I get the best out of this person, whatever, whatever. So I've always enjoyed seeing people grow. At Pure Elite, seeing people grow and develop over the years, whether it be from Tom Coleman doing our first show, seeing what, he was, what his physique was like there, what it, even obviously like what his Instagram account was like there, to, to seeing it now, to seeing people say like imaging, the way that she's grown and changed, or Zoe Wright, the way she's changed. Um, you look at Lauren Canini, you look at Josh, you look at Jade, you look at Charlie. There's so many. You look at Tim Chase. I could I could go on James Ferguson. The so, list is yeah. quite Lisa long. Ferguson. Um, there's so many. There's so many names. If I I'll be here all day if I mention everybody's name. Um, one person I always say was Dean Story. Yeah. Um, I to me that that's the that's the like the perfect type of fitness model. Um, he came in, didn't place, got his head down, came back, and I think he came fifth. Then came back again, and I think he came third, and then came back again and, and, and won and got first. Um, that type of journey, and the same with Josh. Mm-hmm. Josh didn't, yeah. didn't place at his first show. Um, second show, I think he didn't place. Or was it his third show? I think he fought. No, his second show, I believe he placed. 
I'm sure. His first show he didn't. Yeah, first second show, place he did. Second place but didn't win. And the, the first time Josh ever won was, was the pro overall and, the, and pro fitness model first. Um, but again, and that was over a four year period, I think, because he took a year out, didn't he? Yes. Um, so th- those type of things is, is, is what I enjoy. But, but also the mental growth you see from people um, is, is amazing as well when, when I talk to people, even people like Maya. So Maya, when she did our first show, um, and, and the way that Maya's whole life has changed. Mm-hmm. Um, and the things that she's gone on to do. Yeah. Um, TV presenter. It's crazy. It is crazy. Shows yeah. In her country. It is crazy. Like we had Dan Rayner say to us the other day that his business wouldn't exist if it wasn't for us. Yeah. I think, That's like what? I think there's a few <laughs> people that could definitely say that if it wasn't for Pure Elite, they also wouldn't have the careers that they have to date. Yeah. That is, it's, a, um, it's a nice humbling thought, to be quite honest. Because, um, well, it's nice to give back. It's nice to see people grow. And as you know, most family, friends, and companies that were still headhunting me in the early days of Pure Elite all thought I was crazy. <laughs> um, and if people are worried about money and think about money and are just driven by that, I'm like, well, you can make more money if you just move back to London and get another job doing what you was doing. It wasn't about that. So two questions based off of that answer. First part is, is that is the reason that you created the transformation category is because you enjoy to enjoy seeing the growth of people. Yeah. Is, is that, so it's that, it's that the creation of that category? It's, it's, a, mixture, it's a mixture of two uh, or three things, really. Um, first, I like seeing the growth and development of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I think within the fitness world, it's all very well and good that someone who may be genetically gifted to look amazing on stage, you, they still have to put the hard work in and they're, they're still working incredibly hard to maintain and to grow. But it also takes a different mindset to start, um, to whether you be overweight, whether you've had an injury, uh, whether you've had an illness, um, all those things. I think it's a different mindset to transform your body um, when you're starting 18 stone or 20 yeah. stone or whatever, um, or you've had cancer. Um, so yeah, I think so. That mindset and that transformation, I enjoy. Secondly, obviously, I've got two chronic illnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I look at that category and just think, wow, because there are some people that may have been in a worse position than me or a similar position than me. Um, so that motivates me. Um, and also, thirdly, I did a transformation. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed doing the transformation, and I got a lot out of doing the transformation as well. So it's those sort of three things um, put into one. Also, other categories that you um, brought into the industry that I dare say weren't there before were um, the beach body category and the tattooed category. What were the reasons um, for introducing those categories? Um, so the beach body, I always thought that there should be a category below um, fitness model for the guys. And when I say below, it's below in muscle mass and um, sort of body fat um, and visible muscle. Um, I always thought there should be. And I was having this conversation with Dan Rayner the other day. Originally, which is why it was called Beachbody, I was going to get them to wear beach shorts. Yeah. Um, that was the whole idea. Um, and it was the, the type of healthy, sort of athletic physique you would see walking down the beach. Like Abercrombie and Fitch yeah. kind of um, style. So that's why it was called Beachbody. And it was coming up towards the, like the first time, and I was like, no, I want to see the legs. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't want the shorts. Um, so, I dro- so I dropped the beach shorts, but I kept, I kept the name. And tattoo, I really like tattoos. And I think in a model-based show, tattoos are very, very commercial. Um, and again, I know in a lot of shows, they either don't like them, mark you down again, mark you down for having them, or force you to cover them. Um, which my mindset to that was, well, th- you're not showing them as they are. Yeah. Um, and then also, if they want to be- have a career as a model, what, what, they've got to cover their tattoos every time they have a photo shoot? Yeah. Like on Instagram, like it just seems weird to me. Um, so yeah, that was just because I personally enjoy that and I get um, enjoyment from that. And then I know the one you didn't mention, so I didn't in- introduce it, um, Mums That Lift. Yeah. So it used to be called, what was it? Yummy Mummy or something in other shows. Um, it just sounded like MILF to me. I just thought it was, I just thought it was, I just thought it was like an over-sexualized name. Um, and I think that the very first show, we called it Yummy Mummy. 
Yeah, and I think it was a case of there was too many I, connotations. I just changed associated it. Yeah, I just didn't like it. In my mind, I was like, I just don't like the name. I don't like the name. Um, and yeah, that's when I changed it to Mums at Lift. And, mm -hmm. I, and I believe a few have followed suit um, since then. Yeah, I think there's been a few name changes since. Yeah. Again, another industry standard set, yeah. which I think is only an, a, a positive thing, especially. It's like a 90s the, name, isn't it? And um, it, yeah, I just don't like the name. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is a little bit. Um, so talking on categories, actually, you've introduced men's physique this year mm -hmm. and uh, bikini wellness and fitness wellness. Yep. Uh, what were your reasons for doing that? And um, I was after answering that, what are your... Uh, in fact, just answer that and we'll move on to the question after you've answered. So, so <laughs> men's physique, um, it's a category I've been asked to have in for about two years, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and... To me, it's a popular category. It's a category that, that our customers want, but also it, I believe it does fall into the model-based category. Yeah. So if you look at the um, IFBB shows and the men's physique shows, the type of um, competitors and athletes that do those um, categories want to be fitness models. Yeah. It's just, they are, sorry, they are fitness models yeah. doing men's physique categories. Yeah. Um, so that was the reason of having that. The wellness categories, was to allow people to have to be able to compete with a softer look um, or if people are not 100% sure how they're going to come in. So sometimes people would go, oh, I'll do bikini and fitness. Um, whereas in reality, maybe they should do bikini and bikini wellness yeah. um, or fitness and fitness wellness. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the difference being is that the bikini normal and the fitness, let's say open, the bikini and fitness open categories, they're both the leaner versions of those categories. Yeah. Um, not ribs, I don't like ribs popping, um, but they're the leaner versions. Um, so obviously fitness, fitness model are going to have far bigger um, shoulders, quads and more ab definition than bikini. Um, but if you're going to come in carrying a little bit more body fat, you'd potentially be the one below. So if you've still got the muscle mass of fitness model, but you're basically just not as lean, so you're gonna have big, still bigger quads, bigger glutes, the bigger shoulders, still a little bit of ab definition, but you're just not coming in shredded. That's fitness wellness. Yeah. And then if you're in bikini, you're normally bikini, but you're, you're coming in, but and you've got either none or the tiniest ab definition, bigger quads and bigger glutes, but you haven't got like the big shoulders or whatever, so you're just four weeks out, say, from like a bikini open sort of physique, that's the wellness category. So I think it gives people the option rather than going, oh, I, may, I want to do two categories and I'll do bikini and fitness. Well, now you can do bikini and bikini wellness. Yeah. So earlier you touched on um, that when you were transitioning from, I don't know if that's the right word, we'll start that again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you were transitioning from uh, corporate world, corporate to fitness industry, that a lot, you were still getting it head on ear that people from your previous industry thought you were crazy. Yeah. Family and friends thought you were mad for leaving this exceptionally successful career behind with you know great projection to go on to do even more incredible, typically successful things. Mm -hmm. um, how did you stay focused on your goal and also kind of ignore everyone telling you were crazy? Because I know a lot of athletes who when they first start competing can probably relate to it relate to it in a similar manner where friends and family tell them you look fine as you are you don't need to be losing weight what are you competing for oh come out have a drink why are you always eating out of tupperware surely you can have just one cupcake and you get people you even hear of people where family and friends will actually fall out with them yeah because of their choice to compete so having gone through a similar experience to yourself of having naysayers uh, what's your experience of that and do you have any advice for people who who are going through something similar. So it's probably a little bit different for me because I believe I'm always right. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> and, I, and I tend to be always right. Um, Most of the time. <laughs> and so it was a business target, which is the same as a sales target. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd done my research, I'd analysed everything, I'd made a business plan, and I was right on that business plan. Mm -hmm. um, so it was sticking to my goals and you can either support me or not basically um, someone's opinion of me doesn't define my opinion of myself um, so I, well, I guess as a competitor you can sort of twist that as well to be the case of 
if you set yourself a goal, go for the goal. It's irrelevant what other people think of you. Um, everyone's got an opinion of somebody. Uh, like, what's it matter, to be quite honest? And we have opinions of other people. Yeah. It has no impact on their life, to be quite honest. You don't have to listen to those things. Um, you can take on board advice, but if you know you're right, or even if it's something you just want to do, you only hear once, aren't you? Exactly. So what's the, what's the worst? I'd say, what's the worst that could happen? So let's imagine purely it didn't fail. Well, then I'd just be working in London now. I probably would have achieved my goal of being one of the youngest CEOs in the FTSE 100 company, which is, which is what I was aiming to be. Um, and I would have had a nice experience. Mm-hmm. Like that, that literally, would, and, and I would have had experience that I could have taken into, back into larger companies, and I would have had, um, so if I was being interviewed, it's like, well, I've, met, I've, I've allowed to engage with customers more on a face-to-face basis. Yeah. So there's loads of stuff you get, and that's the same if you're competing. And let's imagine you do one show and you don't enjoy it, which I'm yet to hear someone who didn't enjoy their first Pure Elite, but I've heard people say they don't enjoy prepping. I'd, I'd think if you you've got to be a unique kind of person yeah. to enjoy prepping. I think you do the prep because of the end goal. Like, do you want the end goal more? So you're willing to go through yeah. what it takes to prep. So with that, you're you're setting yourself a goal. So you're goal driven. You're probably highly competitive. Um, but I also think sometimes it, it's it gives you something. I think routine and dedication is is something that is needed in life. Mm-hmm. And I think it's sometimes something that some people can sort of hide away from. Um, But I think the positives of routine and dedication aren't probably expressed enough, to be Mm -hmm. quite honest. Um, And prepping for a show and having an end goal, um, I believe has got massive, massive benefits to your mental health and just the way that you live your life. Um, Even the days that when you're, so the days when someone doesn't want to go to the gym or doesn't want to do the cardio, is the same as someone that doesn't want to go to work or doesn't want to do a presentation. Yeah. Like everyone has the, oh, I can't be bothered with today. And sometimes they can be your best day at work or your best day in the gym. At the very least, the endorphins you get or the reward factor you get from doing something that you didn't necessarily want to do is massive, massively understated. But we all know it exists. Yeah, I suppose it's on those days it plays into the end goal, doesn't it? It plays into the overall progress. Um, Pure Elite Bikini uh, Pro World Champ Amelia Tank um, said that when she was prepping and the experience of prepping has actually learned her to be disciplined yeah. in other areas of her life. Hmm. So uh, I do think there's always, as difficult as prep can be, there's always something to take away from it. Um, so where is Pure Elite going? We've sort of discussed how it came into fruition um, the past six years. What, where do you see the, the Pure Elite legacy going? Where do you see it heading? What are your hopes and dreams? World domination. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to keep on having a show that um, everyone enjoys coming to. Um, they enjoy the day and we're in more countries. Um, I, I think we should be in more countries now. Um, we've obviously had Estonia three times I think we've been to Estonia yeah. got Ireland coming up I think everybody knows there's a few countries that we're currently looking at yes. um, so yeah if in five years time we are not just the fastest and the largest fitness model show in the UK we're not just the fastest uh, in Europe um, I want to be the largest fitness model show in the world and do you think you'll achieve it yeah you heard it here first, ladies and gents. So do Why, you... don't, don't you? Well, yeah, it's my plan. It's <laughs> the plan. I don't do failure. <laughs> what is it? There's no such thing as failure, just an opportunity to learn something new, yes. which is uh, very true for those of you out there that are currently watching this at the moment. All right, so before we leave, do you have any kind of last messages to... The athletes, either old, new, all of the above, any lasting comments or statements you would like to make? Um, just thank you, really. It's when, you, when we started as a business, getting people to buy into the way Purely is, the way we're different, the way we wanted to interact, the extra things that we wanted to do, um, to me, competing with Purely is more than just show day. Um, it's the photo shoots we do, it's the meet and greets we do, it's the social media interaction, the, the Facebook groups, Instagram speaking to each other, um, the way people are backstage, the way everyone is friendly, nice and helps each other. Um, I love it when I do pop backstage every now and again and I see 
say like a seasoned pro that's been competing with us for three, four, five years, helping out a first time competitor. So just thank you really, thank you for understanding what Purely is about, believing in what Purely is about, and continuous to, continuing to be with us and growing with us. Well, is there anything, did you say is there anything else? Yeah, like is there anything else um, that you want to get across? Do I get a birthday cake for Purely? My God, yeah, and I can definitely be the one that helps eat that. We'll have to um, give it out at the show in well, I, April. You know, I used to buy cake for Purely, the Purely cake. Oh my God, yeah, why did that stop? Um, I, what did I place it with? I don't know. Did we just go and get loads of different I think we've got more sweets and, and chewing instead. gum and stuff. So mm. I used to get the cake and Haribo and water. Yeah. Um, now we get more oh, treats. Because I think a few other people started doing the cake, so then I moved on to other stuff. Yeah. I was like, it's a great idea. I'm glad I've introduced this. <laughs> I'll now do something else. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll get another cake. A cake for that. Yeah, I'll do that. Are you going to sing Happy Birthday? To be honest. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Happy birthday, pure elite. Happy birthday, pure elite. Happy birthday, dear pure elite. Happy birthday, pure elite. Did you like that? I did, yeah. Perfect rendition. I'm off to go get a contract with Simon Cowell. Sorry, my time here is done. <laughs> Talking about time here done, thank you very much for coming to the studio and spending some time with us this afternoon. Uh, don't forget to like and share. It's a and point. Do I have to point somewhere? I don't know where it's going to be, so we All can right. do a bit of this and hopefully it'll end up in the right position. Uh, do leave us a comment in the comment section if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube. And as always, thank you very much for watching. Bye. Ha <laughs> <laughs>